Dembski and, and William Dembski here in the so-called uh, uh, intelligent design movement, challenging the whole concept of, uh, of Darwinian evolution. And the result of that is that we think very differently about what it means to be part of a community. If, in fact, uh, this is not the problem of the scientists, but the applications of the science, if, if it is a ma totally materialist world, uh, if we are the product strictly of evolution, then we start to have different attitudes as we have in the, in the 20th century about what it means to be human and what are the consequences of our actions. We start to explain problems in law enforcement based on DNA, for example, or, or, or our genetic disposition. And, um, and that robs You're us. You're criticizing Yes, it, it robs us of a lot of our, our humanity because it robs us of responsibility and self and, and self responsibility. So would you respect so I think, the ability I of science? I think that this can be. Oh, oh, I think we need a debate about it. I think there, there's a, it's important to have a discussion, a civil discussion, about these uh, topics. But I also think that the applications to our politics and to our law enforcement, to our uh, social order itself, are, ought to be considered on a larger on a larger point. Wait, does that mean social now, order was perfect before Darwinian of evolution? Of course not. No, so no. then what, why, why blame it on that? No, I'm Surely saying Surely nations lay siege to other nations before Darwin was ever born. It has nothing to do with, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with how we see the world in which we live today and whether it is a materialist world. Now we talk about uh, new communities. Uh, if, if in fact evolution is to be guided, as Ray Kurzweil says, uh, by technology, that technology is going to take over the evolutionary process, then we have a very different world uh, than we do uh, uh, if, if, in fact, the computer, as George Gilder says, is the triumph of mind over matter. It, it, it has to do with how you see human beings. Michael Behe's point is about God. I mean, his book is... No, based, it's not, well, actually. Yes, it is. The idea of the book is that Darwinian evolution is a nice idea, but some things could only possibly be explained by having been created by a higher power. I found that a very interesting book. But are you by any chance saying that one can't have these kinds of ethics and this kind of community without religion or God? I just want to no, see think, if that's what I, I think. No, I think you can have an ethical order and have. I mean, you had this. You had the Stoics and various other people in uh, history. You have, but you do have. It is true that a an ethical order based on the idea that there is a design in the universe. That's what really he's saying. It looks like there's a design in the universe. A design by God. That. that it doesn't describe what what that designer what the, he's very coy about, what the but designer he's might be, but he does say it looks like there's a design. I wanted to say that the way I'm using evolution I, I know. is not the narrow definition of mechanistic Darwinian evolution. I got it from Teilhard de Chardin, yes. with the idea that there is a process of creation leading to higher complexity, greater consciousness, and freedom. Nobody knows precisely how that design got in there, but I think there is certainly the imminence of design. Yes. Let's, let's let's some some what what I'd I like think to that's do, a very good distinction. I'm yeah. glad you made it. Yeah. What, what I'd you. like to do, Neil, is uh, let's get into <laughs> the workings of the scientific mind and, and tell us how scientists think. It's very different <clears throat> from your average societal mental thoughts. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are th there, we're trained to be problem solvers. We're, we're trained to trim the fat off of a question and get to the, 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 the dew drop essence <laughs> of what matters in it and focus further analysis onto that. And as you get closer, maybe there's more fat to be trimmed. And you narrow your questions so that you can bring yourself closer to the truth <laughs> of how the universe works. And we want the whole universe. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and we don't always know if the questions we ask are the ones that would lead to the answers. Because in the end, your, your, your knowledge base and your ability to figure out answers to problems, that's what wins the argument. It's not how loud you are, or how persuasive you are, or whether you won debating contests in your day. It's, it's because in the end, you're answerable to nature. Nature is the ultimate adjudicator of all of what we do. So we are, we, we are humble in the presence of how nature can actually uh, send us back to the drawing board. And do you think that this uh, type of information is, is useful in unifying humanity? Yes, because it's, it's, it's one universe. It's our universe. I can tell you that when a comet is seen in the sky, and I tell you it's got chemical composition that's identical to what you've got in the human body, to me, that's, that's empowering. That tells you that, we're, that we, are, we are stardust. And mm -hmm. to, to me, the community is not just what your little neighborhood does, all deference to what communities were in the 1950s. Community is, is a sense of what your place is in the universe. Mm -hmm. And that place uh, can, can give you a word. I know it sounds all pie in the sky, but it, it's what what flows through my veins every time I study problems in the universe. Yeah.
But, Sarah? But that would, that, I mean, I think that in some part rests on everybody feeling like they have an equal stake in the universe, right? That, um, that if everybody is a part of a community, a universal community, then um, there has to be some sense of belonging. And mm -hmm. I, I just don't feel that a, a large percentage of America feels that way. I think there is increasing Look, fragment. how about the Hubble telescope? Beautiful pictures come out. They make cover story of Time magazine. It's mostly tax-based money that paid for that. I see people gathering around, asking questions about it. I, I see a Which sense of... Which people, though? If the I mean, people you're talking about, Sarah, people buy the would magazine. not gather around, I think that's partly... You're, you're right. It's because they feel disincluded from society. But it doesn't have to be that way. People that you're talking about could take delight in seeing oh, pictures of the planet Mercury, I'm despite sure. the inequities on Earth. The and fact that they don't is... Educa is if, ed yes. if education were more... And you yes. know, it may be that some of them do. I believe, as, as you were saying, that having the larger view, if it's presented, I'm not saying that everybody would get it, but when it's presented, it's truly in our biochemical brains uh, being that we are the universe awakening. Like as that picture people. of Earth from the astronauts. It's the that, truth. That, that it changed how we thought of Earth. That mm -hmm. a picture of Earth that had no, no national boundaries, just continents. And that that, that actually shifted humanity to another step. Mm -hmm. And we started thinking of this delicate, fragile planet, the spaceship Earth, moving That's through. That's true. I'm not that saying happen. that people are not interested. Yeah. People yeah. are deeply <laughs> interested in, these, in, uh -huh. in science and technology. Young people, if taught and provided with this information mm -hmm. would be mm -hmm. deeply well, that's interested. Well, that's the challenge. That's the challenge. Yeah, it is right. Yeah. But I don't think that would move them any closer to a sense of commonality with those that oppress them, unless there's th those that oppress, the haves, equally say they are part of my universe as well. John, what's the relationship between language and culture? Well, the fact of the matter is that the development of a different form of the dominant language is part of the formation of a different culture. It goes along with it. It's something that you would expect. Like, for example, in this country, um, if you notice, even African Americans who have many degrees and who spend a lot of time with white people who are quite fluent in the general society, almost always, about 99% of the time, have what we don't call, but which in fact is, a black accent. There is a such thing as sounding black. It's not a matter of slang, it's not a matter of sentence structures, but it's a matter of just sound. You can generally tell on the radio even when somebody on NPR is black. It's just there. And the reason for that is that there is, and has always been, a feeling in the black community, regardless of socioeconomic level, of a certain sense of separation and of oppression of things that we all know quite a bit about. And as a result of that, the fact of the matter is that except in bizarre, if I may, Neil cases like Neil and me, generally, you know, <laughs> African Americans do not sound like, for example, you, Robert. That's just the fact. And so what that means is that if there is a community, if there's a community feeling, then there's going to be a different form of language. And that's true in Bavaria. That's true in New Guinea. And that is an index of community. It's also true in, say, scientific communities. You know, there's different, there are different forms of language that scientists use or that chefs use or that mechanics use. It's an index of community. Neil, science, scientific communities, African-American communities, I've got to turn to you. you know, <laughs> take your choice. <laughs> well, I want to distinguish between word choice and actual, just because some jargon uh, contains a category of words that are not common, I, I, I don't think of that as a, a different way of communicating necessarily. Mm. Uh, but I can, I can tell you that in many of the, much of the scientific community, language is introduced to, to, to provide a level of precision that the native English does not allow. And, that's, and so often the language becomes kind of stilted and becomes kind of dry. But I can tell you, in astrophysics, we have no such rules. Big red stars in the universe are called red giants, right? <laughs> As they, the beginning of the universe, big bang. <laughs> and, and, and I think our language was never separatist. Uh, not purposefully, but as much as the universe is complicated enough, why complicate it with, with uh, polysyllabic tell, words? You know, are you not telling us that uh, astronomers are, are, are the elite because they use good language? Uh, because we use common language. Mm -hmm. We draw our vocabulary sets come from the general public. But from, Neil, I from, couldn't read an astrophysics paper. You know, uh, the, 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 well, no, you could. You could. You, you could pick out the word "red giant" in there and, and yeah. make, <laughs> say other things that are complicated. But the yeah. thing itself that is that I could manage. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but doesn't the fact that we have a scientific class create a new elite where knowledge becomes a great separator of society, whereas money and class used to be, but now it's knowledge? Yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's the reality, and I think that it'll it will continue. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a battle between the, the knows and the knows not. I think well, one of the most important things that's happening now in education is that 
educators are realizing this gap and they're trying to do something.